It will be so good to get back together again and sing and have fellowship and potlucks. I really miss potlucks at church. Uh, I miss handshakes and hearing those unmistakable laughs of people in the auditorium as they're joking around. I miss hearing comments and conversations and it'll be so good to get back to normal and we're getting there slowly. And please keep people in your prayers and keep yourself in check when it comes to how you're treating people, how you're reacting to things, because frustrations can easily produce sin. So watch out for those frustrations. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 again this morning. A lengthy letter of 1 Corinthians to a church, a people of God who are having trouble within the assembly. They have been scolded by Paul about being divisive, about having so many conflicts and infighting between the brethren, about being too proud relying on their own decision-making, not seeking God's final decisions about anything. And this is a church that Paul says is too arrogant about everything. And in chapter 5, they are even arrogant about their sin. In verse 1, he begins, It's actually, actually reported among you that there is sexual immorality, a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans, for a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you were assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. The name of the Lord Jesus, the power of the Lord. There's a truth that always needs to be at the front of our lives as Christians, and that is that Christ is my Lord. Christ is the head of the church. He is the authority, my authority, and that Christ is the king of his kingdom, and his kingdom is the church. It's a simple truth that we need to have in our brains before we get into the issue of handling sin in the church, church discipline among the members of the church, which we'll be discussing at length over the next few weeks, hopefully. But this is what I want you to understand. This is what I want you, your, your base thought to be as we get into this. Christ is king. Christ is Lord. Christ is leader over the church. Ephesians 5.23, Christ is head of the church. And as king over his kingdom, all those people who claim service to the king, all those who claim to be part of the kingdom of Christ, are to be followers of the king. Now, does that make sense? All of those people who claim to have Christ as king, follow their king. They're not rebellious against the king. They're not rising up against the king. They're not someone who does things contrary to the king's laws and decrees. It's elementary Bible stuff, right? Simple and basic. Christ is king in his kingdom, and we follow the king. All the people in the church are to live within the king's decrees, follow the king's laws in his kingdom, do what the king says and live how the king says to live. The church is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. He's my king, and oh, I dearly love him, as the song says. Jesus is Lord, my redeemer. You have sung this truth over and over and over again. Christ rules over his church. He has set up the laws of his kingdom, the boundaries of his kingdom through his word. We have the written down decrees of our king, of God, on what should happen in his kingdom and what should not happen in his kingdom. We have been given by God decrees on what behavior is acceptable in that kingdom and what behavior is not acceptable. And he has plainly stated for us how we should live and move and have our being within his kingdom. And if we refuse to live by the king's words and the king's decrees, then there are consequences, disciplines that have to be clearly shown. Every medieval movie has taught you that you've ever watched this principle about kings and about kingdoms. Every fairy tale story you've ever read, every in-depth video game, you know, mode story you've ever played. There are laws within the borders of every kingdom. There is a king who gives the law. There is a king who gives the law. There is a king who gives the law. And there are people within the kingdom who serve and carry out the words and the decrees of the king. And while in our fairy tale stories, the king may be some kind of a tyrant, you know, who oppresses the people, Christ is a perfect king with compassion on all those who will come to him. Come to me, all 
you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Jesus is a gracious king who loves his people, but he is still king. And the fact that Christ is king still remains. And as king, we are to serve him. We are to follow him. We are to submit to him. And now this is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the church. You are the population of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You are. But outside of this kingdom of Christ is another. Because as you know very well, not everyone serves Jesus as king. Not everyone calls Jesus their Lord, if you haven't noticed the world today. The kingdom of Christ is the opposite of this world. We do not follow the world. We don't follow its desires. We follow Jesus. We keep our eyes on Jesus. We follow the decrees of our king. So what kingdom is outside of Christ and his kingdom? Well, that is the kingdom of the devil, the kingdom of this world. And all those who simply follow the desires of this world are really just following the devil. So there are those within the kingdom of Christ and there are those that are outside of the boundaries of Christ. Jesus even says in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 26, if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? Jesus says that there's a kingdom of Satan, a place where Satan rules. You know, don't follow anything has to do with God. Do whatever you want. Live however you want. And when you come across someone who follows Christ or God, persecute them, laugh at them, insult them, and lure them away from the Christ-led kingdom over there. Two kingdoms. First John chapter 5 and verse 19 says the whole world is under the power of the evil one, the devil. If you remember our study on John 14, Jesus says, as he's explaining to the disciples the events of the cross that were just a few hours away, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has no power over me. The ruler of this world. He was talking about Satan. Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. The world is the devil's kingdom. So get this in the background as the movie of our text opens in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and the camera shows you the landscape of the map of this world. There are two kingdoms. One kingdom is ruled by Christ. And all those within that kingdom live to serve their king. They love his laws. They delight in his statutes. They live and behave like they follow Jesus. Their every movement is to glorify the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And this kingdom is the church. Those who confess him, those who are washed by him, those who are sanctified by him, those who love him. And we as the church are servants of Jesus, the king. However, there is another kingdom surrounding the church, always surrounding the church. A kingdom which is only of this world, a kingdom which is ruled by Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of darkness, the father of all lies, and everything outside of the kingdom of Christ is defined by God as evil. Because everyone outside of the kingdom of Christ is under the sinful dominion of Satan. If you are a part of the kingdom of God, you are are ruled over by Christ who sets us free from sin. If you are in the kingdom of God, you don't continually reject the truth and walk in the darkness of sin. You don't reject your king's decrees. You don't reject your king. You've been set free to walk in the light. So it's an either or deal. Either we are living in the kingdom of God's dear son, forgiven, washed, sanctified citizens of heaven, followers of Jesus, or we are under, under the dominion of the evil one, desiring and focusing merely on the stuff of the world and what we want to do. And we join the masses of those who have rejected Jesus as their king, rejected his kingdom, and now follow the Lord of sin who rules over the world. Two kingdoms, two rulers. And when we get into the sin that is mentioned by Paul that was going on in the church, this present tense continuing to happen sin, that was happening in this family at the church at Corinth, you began to see these two kingdoms being brought out by Paul's language. The kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of the devil. There are things that will never be accepted within the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And if someone refuses to repent, then they are to be removed from that kingdom in the name of the king. If someone refuses to repent, it just keeps on rebelliously doing what they're doing, then they're to be removed from the kingdom in the name of the king. So to review from last week, there was a sin that was commonly reported about. Everybody knew about it, a sin that was very public in nature that was happening within the church at Corinth. Now, I want you to remember the church at Corinth is supposed to be ruled by Jesus as king. Jesus the king has already told us that sexual immorality is not to be something that is happening among the church, among the kingdom. But there was a man in Corinth 
who was committing the kind of immorality that isn't even heard of amongst the kingdom of Satan, amongst the pagans, for a man has taken his father's wife. And what we talked about last week was, was the reaction of this sin within the kingdom of Christ should have been one of mourning. How can someone do this to our king? How can someone do this to Jesus, to the church, to his kingdom? This is not supposed to be happening. And Paul even says, ought you not to mourn? But the church wasn't acting like the church. They weren't acting like Jesus was their king or that they were a part of his kingdom. Because if Jesus was their king, then they would have followed his words concerning sexual immorality. Now notice the wording of Paul, starting with the last part of verse 2. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Now remember, there is the kingdom of Christ, the church. There's the kingdom of Satan, everything outside the church. If you're removed from one, then you only have one other place to go, right? If you're removed from one, you only have one other place to go. And if you're removed from the kingdom of Christ, you've been placed into the only other kingdom, and that is Satan's. And just for those of us who might think that, that, that Paul was offering a little bit too harsh of a punishment, too quick of a punishment, that Paul seems to have gone straight for the 12-gauge of church discipline when he should have started off with a BB gun as a warning, Paul has already addressed the issue of sexual immorality in the first letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth in chapter 5 and verse 9. That's right, the first letter. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people in the church, that those who bear the name of Jesus who are living like they don't. Those who say they bear the name of Jesus, but they continue to live in open and impenitent sin, chapter five and verse 11. So he says, I've already written to you about sexual morality. I've already written to you about the decree of the king when it comes to his kingdom. So just a side note, this is referring to what's commonly called the lost letters of Paul. There was another letter written to Corinth, which we do not have, just like there was another letter written to the church at Laodicea in Colossians 4 and verse 16. I don't remember learning the letters to Laodicea in Sunday school song in the books of the New Testament. Anyway, Paul has already addressed the sin of sexual immorality in a previous letter. What to do about it, how you define it in the kingdom of Christ, in the church. He's already talked about it in that letter. So it's not like Paul just pumps the spiritual 12 gauge as soon as he hears about this sin going on in the church. It's already been addressed in written form at least once before. The decree has been sent. The decree has been resent. And the representative of the king, the apostle Paul, has spoken the words of the king, spread it all around the kingdom and the church at Corinth concerning sexual immorality twice now. And twice now, apparently it hasn't produced repentance. So what happens now that this man who claims to be a citizen of the kingdom of Christ, this man who claims to be a part of the church, but continues to live in, in this sin. What happens now that this man who claims to serve the King Jesus is now in present tense, continuing guilty of sexual sin while claiming to be a present tense servant of the kingdom of God's dear son. This is what Paul says. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And Paul judges the situation simply based upon what the word of God has already said, simply based upon what the king has already decreed that his kingdom should look like and be like and how those who are a part of the kingdom of God should behave. And what Paul does not do is that Paul does not ask for the church's opinion on what to do. He doesn't call for some Zoom meeting where everyone gets together and talks about the best way to handle the situation. And this is the interesting thing. Paul doesn't even call on the elders or the deacons or the leadership of the church to be expected to handle this. He calls for the congregation, the citizens of the kingdom, to apply correction and discipline in the name of Jesus Christ the King. He calls on the congregation, the citizens of the kingdom, to apply correction and discipline. If you're a citizen of the kingdom of Christ then there are simply things you don't continue to do. And there are situations in sin that you do not accept. There are things that you do not tolerate within the kingdom of Jesus. And Paul expects the church to act like they know what their king wants them to do. Let me say that again. Paul expects the church to act like they know what their king wants them to do. And this is not like the tax code, right? Where you have to be able to read accountant speak in, the, you know, in Latin. This is the Lord going, don't commit this sin. This is the kingdom of Christ. Don't commit this sin. And Paul simply acts on the truth of the kingdom, the decrees of the kingdom. He sums it up like this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, 22. The church is told, everybody in the church is told, test all things. 
prove what is good. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Don't have to do, don't have anything to do with evil. Don't have anything to do with all the things that are going on in Satan's kingdom. And the citizens of the kingdom of Christ are to carry those decrees out. Everybody is to test and prove what is good. Everybody is to abstain from evil. Everybody is told to hold fast to good. And if a situation comes along in the church where someone in the church is doing something evil and continuing to do something evil, then Paul says to the church, handle it. You know what your king accepts. You know what your king rejects. You live in this kingdom too. You know what's expected of you. And it's what Jesus exemplified in his own words. This, these are the king's own words in Matthew 18, verse 15 through 17. He says, if there's a person who sins against you, you go and tell them. If somebody's offended, you go and tell them. If they don't hear you, go and take two or three witnesses so that every word is established. If they refuse to listen, then you tell it to the church. If they refuse to listen to the church, the citizens of the kingdom of Christ, then let that person be as a heathen. Let that person know that that's the activity of the kingdom of Satan, not the activity of the church. It's the activity of the church to let this person be as a heathen to the church. Not just the leadership of the church, not just a few who come together and say, this is bad. It's the whole church. And that's what the kingdom is supposed to do because that's what the king has told us to do. There are two kingdoms, the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of Satan in the world. And if a person in the kingdom of Christ is acting like an impenitent heathen, then they are to be delivered to where impenitent heathens are. <laughs> and that is where Satan is, chapter 5 and verse 5. There's a lot more in this text that we're going to talk about uh, next week, Lord willing. But what I want you to see is this. There seems to be uh, this spiritual safety within the fellowship of Christ's kingdom, within the church. When you are in fellowship, relationship, when you have closeness with the people of like precious faith, there seems to be an element of spiritual safety. We see this in uh, the analogy of the church being sheep led by the good shepherd. And, and there were 90 and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold as we sing sometimes. And there's this element of spiritual safety within the fellowship of the local church, much like the element of safety within the borders of a kingdom. And the closer you are, okay, the closer you are to that population, the people of faith, then the more secure and stable you become, the more that your faith grows. The closer you are as a member of that fold, you're being led by that good shepherd. However, when you are guilty of sin, when you are desiring to commit sin, when you keep committing sin and doing wrong, here's my question. Where is the last place that you want to be? When you know that what you're doing is sinful, and you know that your life has not been glorifying to God, where is the last place you want to be? The last place you want to be is church. The last place you want to be is where you're reminded of your sin. You don't want to gather together with the kingdom citizens. So you go to the only other place where that sin is accepted. Outside. You leave the flock, and out there, as far as your faith is concerned, there is nothing but vulnerability. When you get farther and farther away from the safety of the fold, when we choose to leave the borders of the kingdom, we are vulnerable. Like that one sheep who wandered away was vulnerable to attack. Like the prodigal son, when he left his father's house, became more vulnerable to all the temptations of the flesh, the sins of the world. And he spent every dime that he had on his sinful life until he was almost destroyed. He was in a pig pen desiring to eat the leftovers. His body was obviously wasting away if you are right there. He left the father's house, desired to be a heathen. He desired to leave. So his father let him because he wasn't gonna do that stuff in the house. You were in one of two places this morning. 
you are either in the kingdom of God's dear son, inside the borders of your king, serving and submitting to your king, Jesus Christ, in the shelter of the fold, like those 90 and 9, or you have wandered away, you've desired to leave the kingdom, and you left the borders of the kingdom of Christ, and now you are vulnerable to Satan's attack. And as you see this picture, I want you to see Satan as that roaring lion walking around the borders of the kingdom, seeking whom he may devour. Those who go beyond the borders of God's dear son. Are you in spiritual safety this morning because you walk with your king, serving him, giving him glory? Or are you outside? Are you in Christ or are you outside of Christ? Are you walking with your king or not? And if not, come back to him and he will welcome you with open arms.